Welcome to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast, featuring in-depth interviews with people in hip-hop culture, based out of New England. We made it. Nice, we did it. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that, man. Jason, that was the first. Yeah, it happens, it happens for sure. Yeah, how you doing? Good, no complaints. Dude, it's been too long, it's been way too long. I know, man, I'm used to seeing you everywhere. I know, I know, it's crazy. But but you also transitioned out of what you were doing before, right? So like I, yeah, I, I, I don't, like, I don't do as many shows as I used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. dude, those were the days. Those those are su- such awesome times. Like those, yeah. all of those are like a, a lifelong, timeless memory. You know what I mean? All the shows we did. Yeah, I was thinking like, uh, you know, we start, when we first started working together. You were you were a duo, Juice and Della, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. What was the what was the first show we did? Because I was trying to remember what it was and I couldn't remember. Yeah, so so it's crazy. So we got the idea to hit you up about the Cam Meekin show. Who like like uh, now told me, you know, now we've worked together several times and stuff. But like, I remember at at that time I'm like, dude, this would be sick. Like I feel like the the anyone that would come to the audience would be like on brand with what we're building. And then you actually responded saying, like, what about a downstairs show? And you put us on the A Rap music show. So I was like, you know, I wasn't expecting that off the bat. I was kind of trying to get a response about the upstairs, but <laughs> A Rap Music was a great show. That was yep, that was yep. uh, that's right when EDM was starting to really take off. Yep, yep. the live performance was kind of, crazy too. Like the yeah, really hitting it. You know, yeah, and he's from Rhode Island, and like yeah, the way he he would do the pads. That was when I was starting to get into EDM a little bit. Like yeah. I was trying to tap into that market. Yep, because um, it was booming, and uh, he was a good crossover artist because he had hip hop influence. Yeah, it's so sick, dude. That's so fire. And then and then I think right after that was Raekwon. Oh, I had you on Raekwon too? Yeah, yeah. Dude, that was, yeah. That's, that's legendary. That's iconic. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so with that note, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Leeds Edutainment uh, podcast. We got a very special guest today, uh, MC and Hustler. <laughs> <laughs> viral, viral marketer. Uh, oh uh, Just Juice is in the building. Hell yeah! Thank you for what having. What you got there? You got like a dis disco tech going on back there. You yeah, got yeah. Lights flashing. What is that? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, right now, I guess they're trying to tell me they're broken or like out of batteries or something. But they flash user remote. It goes to just one solid color, and I have like a ring light here. So like when I do a video in this room, usually the the clouds look pretty magical. Like when I say with the filter and stuff, it kind of doesn't look like a do a DIY creation. You know, looks a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Sick, it's cool, it's cool vibe, you know. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about you and your brother. Um, you brought you and your brother are very close, right? Yeah, yeah really close. close. Yeah. Does he make the oh, beats? Yeah. Mojo make the beats? I mean, he he used to make beats for sure, and I loved like freestyling over them. We have uh several songs that like like several like even like fan favorites where he drops like a crazy verse, but he he doesn't produce as much. He helped a lot with the uh, like organization and I guess managerial type stuff, but not he's not like a direct in house producer right now of the actual beats, but. A lot of them he did do. So you guys kind of grew up as brothers, like loving hip hop and that type of yep. family atmosphere. And he's 100%. older than you, right? No, we're, we're identical twins. I'm two minutes. Oh, you're older. twins. Yeah, I'm two minutes older. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's the reckless one, though. I'm sure. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah, because we'd be like, you. We got at the shows. We'd be like, don't give Mojo too many drink tickets. <laughs> That's so crazy. That's so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like disclaimer right off the rip. Watch out with <laughs> Mojo and the uh, the drink tickets. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, the drink tickets. Yeah, I remember I remember him getting escorted out of one of the shows before we even went on stage. I think it was like a, a headliner upstairs, and it was like he's getting dragged out or like getting suggested that he leaves like ten minutes before we go on. All right, I'll see you after. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, good old good. And you post a lot of funny videos of your brother too. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's definitely a character, but yeah, identical twins. So so you guys were like fed off each other supported each other in the beginning making music and everything 100 100 right? whether it was with the beats being made or beat beat selection or like you know where to take inspiration or influence from or like actually writing the songs like um like obviously like one of my one of my bigger streaming songs is lavish with logic and so mojo like we obviously coordinated all the verses and everything together super organic in-house type thing but he uh i think he just like i think he took an interest in the managerial side too kind of not being he doesn't he doesn't want the eyes on him he kind of wants to still put in the grind you know take the responsibility win take the reward together but i don't think he likes the like the light of it all as much as someone else who wants to expand the audience would you know i think he likes to take a back seat 
Well, you would have fooled me because he was dancing on stage on many of your shows, dude, taking a lot of the lights. So dude, I know, I know, I know. And sometimes it was hard for me to take my eyes off Mojo. I know. It was a little bit a of a draw on the Mojo at all times. Yeah, you give him the drink tickets, it's it's on you. It's uh, he, he becomes a hypocritical liability. He definitely wants to turn up at that point, you know. He's tur- He's definitely turning up. It's pretty funny. Yeah, he's the best. If anyone's been to a Just You show, Mojo is definitely uh, a highlight of the <laughs> So crazy. So yeah. Juice and Della, we do these shows, right? And yep. I did a I did a logic I did a logic show early, like yep, right before yep. Logic took off in the upstairs. Right. You guys were there. Did you guys yep. open on that show? I don't think you did. You were just there. No, no, we we were just like there, just supporting. We we didn't open for that one. Yeah. Is at this point, are you solo or are you still Juice and Della? Um, by then I think it was solo. I think it was just Juice because uh, okay. yeah, because I I think around that time we were we were like developing the lavish song with Logic, and I don't. I don't know if uh, we were all in, like the same sessions together. I don't, I don't know if Della was coming down and, yeah, you know, because because I did notice a change. Like the Juice and Della sound was more like classic hip hop sound, yep. right? Like yep. rapping yep. style. But then when you go solo, you kind of modernize to what's current at that. Point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty crazy. Like I'm, I'm definitely inspired and like influenced by everything. And with, I guess when I would rap or write with Della, like really, you know, that that true like raw, rugged, rough rap like dope right. lyricism, like we're playing all that, that would definitely come out because we do so many like on the spot ciphers together. We'd go on the MBTA trains and like rap for like people just trying to get to yeah. work and stuff. And like, that was definitely like a time where I was nonstop freestyling, nonstop ciphering. So I think that kind of just came out because like those were the beats we were freestyling to. So we right. would approach those kind of beats and handle it that way. But definitely once going solo, I wanted to uh, expand the sound and like, Cause, Cause I'm so, I'm so moved by like all different types of mu- music that like, it wasn't necessarily a rap sound that I would listen to on one day. Maybe it'd be some pop songwriting or, or some R and B songwriting or something like that. And I would just get inspired by it and try to branch out with the sound and try new sounds and, you know, not just box my own creativity into one, you know, lane. Right. So one of the big moves that you made was working with logic early in your career. Talk, sure, to me about yeah. how that, how, talk to me about how that even happened because you developed an insane relationship with oh, logic yeah. that he, he brought you on stage in, yeah. on, in front of thousands and thousands yeah, of people. Okay. Yep. Talk to me how this whole thing went down. Yeah. Yeah. I will say from the very beginning, which is about 12 years ago, um, ever since meeting logic, he's definitely been a big brother you know, big brother figure to me with, within the music and outside of the music. Definitely. I see him as a mentor, but also as a good friend. And um, around that time, like you said, it was before he really popped off. He was doing, I think he did the hard rock cafe, then did upstairs Middle East. And um, I'm you know, stop you real quick. Yeah. He wasn't even headlining that Middle East show. It was right, a right, dual right. headline with Tayyip Ali. Right, so he, right, right, at right. this point, logic is like, yep. you know, I mean, it sold out. It was Putting a great show. Yeah. It was a legendary uh, show, but like that's how small it was at that time. Yeah, 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 yeah legendary. But um, but I I loved like watching all of the the moves he'd make. It, it inspired me a lot. You know, a lot of the words we'd exchange would inspire me not to give up, even in day to day real life situations and stuff. It was it's, it's definitely been like a big brother type vibe to me. And uh, even all these years later, when we text, it's like he's still just as looking out for what I'm going through, or what I'm dealing with, or like motivating me to try harder, or push harder, or try new sounds and stuff. It's been super organic, super brother brother type vibes you know but um but yeah so so that song lavish uh he he had told me actually outside of that middle east show um we discussed like briefly when his team like went away I talked to some of my friends and stuff he uh he briefly mentioned at some point we'll do a song and more just like you know like i just want to let you guys know to kind of motivate you like we'll be doing a song together i know you guys look up to me in the music game and everything and brother type thing you know but he said we'll do a song so from there we started cutting demos and like you know, Mojo and I were definitely early in our careers. We weren't like, I, I wouldn't say we we're as technically advanced as we are now with, with the rapping or anything like that. So it kind of gave me a push to really experiment and try all kinds of sounds. And then one of the ones that really clicked were the early ideas for Lavish, you know. And then since then, we 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 just recently dropped a song with Trippy Red. It's just used Trippy Red Logic called Sweeter Scars. And honestly, that just further strengthens what I'm saying about expanding the sound. Like, this is like a melodical, like a melodic, like pop banger where Logic comes in with crazy bars, but I'm more so singing about the same pain I would have rapped about, but, you know, branching out, doing a little bit of melodic stuff, you know, and the trippy comes in with a melodic verse, but back to the Logic thing, like he's just, he's just always been that, that person to look up to that's there for me. And that's musically, that's on the stage, off the stage. So it's been super motivating watching him come up and then take me under his wing in certain areas, you know? 
Yeah, from here, like, from here, you kind of take off like virally. Like, yeah, yeah, you start, you start making some serious moves. Yep, like, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put, you know, you start doing these crazy features. You start making these viral videos. You start like, you just nonstop. <laughs> so, yeah. talk to me about this work ethic that you have because you know when I first worked with you and Juice and Dell, I usually talked to you, right? Like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. were like really on top of your business. When we yep. meet up, let's do this. Like you were yep. like. You were staying on top of things really much more heavier than most artists I've seen. Oh, Talk okay. to me about where you got this work ethic from, because I think it's a very important part of your success. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll start by saying it's all like in-house, it's all independent. It's really me making sure, you know, no part or no area of the business lacks because, you know, I grew up, I grew up with tons of motivation and uh push from my father. You know, my, my dad's like an entrepreneur in his, in his own lane. But I, but I grew up very geared towards not lacking in a certain area. Like if you, if you, if you can't walk as well, you got to be able to do something with your mind. If you can't hear as well, you have to be able to cover up for it or overcompensate with your vision. You know, if you can't see, you got to be able to hear. If you can't, hear, you know, that kind of thing. It's like yeah, yeah, you yeah. can't Dope. just crumble or give up if there's something you're not good at or not succeeding at. So he kind of instilled that never give up. You know, ne never like no slowing down. Like if something gets hard, go harder the other ways you can. You know, get around that obstacle, get over it. But um, Nope. Yeah. I mean, but like with, with, with the lavish track coming out um, from there, I was like super amped up because it was like a lot yeah. of new fans coming. It was like, you know, maybe someone on the street would be like, I heard that song. That's you. And so I kind of took that to take the Cypress to a new level. I'd go freestyle in public or, you know, maybe get a little bit ballsy, grab a Walmart intercom and rap for the intercom. You know, I don't know, like some of the things were definitely a little bit disturbing of the piece and whatnot, but I tried to keep it pretty family friendly you know i don't admit the swears and profanity and stuff but definitely yeah. capturing some of those moments obviously put me on a bigger platform you know like yeah like, it's good the, i don't mean to stop you but the viral right. videos you started making were hilarious yeah yeah thank you thank you yeah i mean the intercom one you know i think there was some shirtless videos uh there was rolling up on uh dmx is the one i remember that, the most. that's crazy that was a crazy rest, rest in peace dmx but sure, you rolled up on dmx it just started rapping at him. Yeah, I thought that was the funniest thing about. Yeah. I mean, it, the rap was good, but it was just like just juice just rolled up on fucking yeah, yeah. DMX. Honestly, that strikes me as legendary too. Like watching that video, trying to put myself <laughs> in a fan or new viewer's perspective, I'm like, that that's crazy. That's timeless. But like, we were in the lobby at South by Southwest. We were in the lobby of a hotel that DMX was staying at, and um, we Mojo and I went up to him, told him about one of our friends that kind of grew up on his music and has the lyrics tatted and everything. And he was like, oh, I'll call him right now, like FaceTime or whatever. And X said, what up to my buddy Chandler? And it was like a crazy moment for him because his older sister, who passed a few years before, was the one that got him into DMX. It was just a super like stand up special moment, like super full circle thing for my buddy. So we said we said our goodbye, said thank you, whatever, took the picture and everything. And um, we're like peeling out of the garage or whatever in the car. And then he's there, like just like, I guess, waiting on a ride or something, probably to his concert or something at South by Southwest. And uh, and we had one of his beats playing because we were like kind of on a high from the moment. And so I was just like, wait, what What if I rapped over his beat too? If he showed so much love, I don't think it'll bother him, you know? And and that, I mean, I love that video. That's like a timeless thing. He's definitely a legend in my book and a, a legendary person for the love he showed. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't doesn't have to take his time to do that stuff, you know? The, this vi viral marketing that you did, these videos just, you know, that you got so much like views and attention from them. How crucial was this to your success? Well, I will say that well, there's like nothing like going viral. I mean, it's, it's, it's it, from, from my experience, it could have been multi-million, like, like, I think it's even like close to a billion or something, but like millions and millions of views coming in for this one 10 second clip you recorded, kind of doing everything you've already been doing, but just showcasing it in a unique way. And it's right. like, that that was able to give me, you know, more views, more more viewers or more incoming traffic off these creative ideas or maybe some ballsy ideas. And 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 from there I would channel that traffic over to my real songs and my real catalog. And I'd be like, guys, I'm not just a meme rapper, not just a freestyle rapper, or you know, whatever the whatever the haters' comments would say or trolls would say or whatever. And I'd be like, I make real music, like check it out. I might have worked with one of your favorite artists. I might have dropped a song that's more up your alley than this freestyle. And, you know, it was, I, I was able to figure out kind of like crack a code in which I could turn somewhat vile traffic into actual streams of the songs. And, you know, now the songs have over 100 million streams, you know, um, yeah. like it's it, it was it was definitely like a little formula I had to figure out while doing these viral skits because they wouldn't have been viral if I didn't do them. 
the way that I did them. You know what I mean? They may not have been special or had any momentum at all if I didn't do it a certain way, you know? Well, this this type of marketing that you're doing with these these videos is like yep. really what is standing out more than actual music videos these days. Like you yeah, know, yeah, put you in a live setting and have you rap and show your ability. Yep. That gets people's attention more than just here's my new music video. It's professionally yeah, shot yeah. and done. I mean, I'm seeing this. I, I would say literally. Yeah. Like I, I, right. would, I don't know what you were just about to say. I'm sorry for cutting you off. But no, I, it's all good. <laughs> I'd imagine you've seen someone post a music video. And it's yeah. like, there's not as much love, even though they spent so much money putting it together, the props, the background, the, the extras, the editing. And then it's like, you waited a month to get the video back. And it's like, then someone's just filmed. They take the best six seconds of a little stunt and it's it's out of there, you know? It, it's it's pretty crazy the way it's the game's transformed to like short form content is the wave. And like now all these reels and shorts and TikTok type platforms, you know, they're they're kind of setting you up for if you just do the work and you don't sacrifice quality and you're consistent and you're posting every day or you're posting at least to some sort of routine where they can count on you to post every three days at 3 p.m. If you just do that, you'll get the bare minimum few hundred views that maybe you wouldn't have been able to garner yourself because you're a brand new artist or something. But then they actually give you the chance to shine on a bigger platform if something hits. You know, you can have you can have a million views on your first video on TikTok and maybe no fans yet. And it's like, I don't I, I feel like it's just more accessible. It's more attainable where now like. That little moment you you film in six seconds giggling with your friends is like that could be what channels all the millions of views of you know the, the mid the you know you know the difference between like followers and fans. It's like first you get the views, maybe on the fourth, fifth impression they'll follow you, and then you gotta like convert them towards being your fan by like actually showing them you, your personality, who you are, what you believe in, what you represent. And it's like people are getting the the chance to do that, the opportunity to do that off just being consistent, posting short videos that may have taken a few minutes of their day. You know, it's it's really a crazy game, and it's it's cool to have been at the forefront of of that kind of stuff before the you know it's Twitter back in the day. It wasn't. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's what I want to stop you real quick because you were doing this before TikTok. Yeah, first way before TikTok. Yeah, yeah, you were you were you were doing this really out of all the I can say for like New England artists. Yeah, yeah. Like you were the one that was really doing this the most. From that's what crazy. I saw. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to hear that, that's crazy. I mean, you were, I mean, every technique, every, you learned everything and you, you, you really ran virally marketing and like all these different techniques to grow your fan base. You stayed on top of that stuff right, right, right. to the point where I was like, Oh my, I, I can't even keep up with this guy. Like this yeah, guy is just, crazy. you, I Thank mean, you. that's yeah. what I'm saying. You go back to your work ethic where you're just so on top of it. You're smart. You learn these techniques. Your, your follow through is crazy. I mean, it's just Thank like, you. wow. <laughs> thank you thank you i i would say that probably comes back to trying to be strong in areas if you lack in others it's like i don't know maybe, maybe at first when they told me i don't fit the mold and i wouldn't i wouldn't be a successful rapper because i don't look like what they feel like a rapper should look like which doesn't who told you that yeah 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 like like that doesn't like <laughs> that doesn't make sense we have so many unique artists now and unique personalities and and personas and looks but you know maybe doing what i did tackling what they were commenting on, you know, running with the Jack Black got bars, running with I have no neck, but I rap fire, like going with all those things, maybe, maybe running with those moments helped me. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm honestly super grateful. I am the way I am because perhaps if I did fit the mold, it wouldn't be that insane to see some guy rap well, looking like he raps well on a sidewalk, you know what I mean? Or getting arrested type thing. Like, I, I don't know if it would have done as well if I didn't have to adapt to what at first people told me was my disadvantage and my weak point and my con. You know, I turned those into my pros. I turned those into my my blessings, if you would have even called them a curse before, you know? And I and I yeah, marked I, it. I put it out there, you know? Talk to me about becoming more of a melodic artist. Because, like I said, we talked about we talked about kind of coming off, like, the classic boom bap style and the real yep. lyrical side, yep. and which you can do really well. You rap really fast, and you really can do that. But you also, you also took another direction where you started doing the singing stuff. Yep, yep. Thank you. Yeah. And talk sure. to me about the, we call it melodic, right? The yep. Little, little yeah. More sing, so, little so yeah. more sing song. Talk to me about that transition and has that worked? And it seems like it's worked out better for you. Right. Right. I mean, talk I would say, me I would say each, each kind of approach towards dropping a song that sounds a certain way, like each one has benefited the, the career and movement as a whole in different ways. Like it benefited the trajectory in different ways, but I wouldn't say like I ever wanted it to come off as I would go from boom bap to singing or from rapping fast to singing pop. You know, I, I would just say I, I'm so moved and inspired and literally even influenced by all different genres, you know, like 
like Tech Nine was probably the first rapper I ever listened to. And while mixing in every style I was mixing in at the time, I, he invited me to go on a 63 city tour with him, you know, yeah. and that that's like that full circle type of moment is what I think allows me to feel like I didn't ever fully transition. I didn't ever fully switch. It's like people can respect me for my rapping. And then another seven, eight million people stream my song with a little TJ called World Fall Down, where it's like that may have been a special moment for them. It may have gotten them through a breakup if the love you know, the love related lyrics touch them, but I just really want to be good at all things that I like to do. And I like right. listening to all sorts of music. So I want to be able to drop all of it. And maybe one guy that was expecting a rap song understands this one may not be for them. The next one will be though. So stay tuned in and, and just let the people that appreciate one part, appreciate that part. And when your part comes, you know, appreciate that one. You know, I never wanted it to seem like it's all or nothing in one area or like one or the other, you know? I, yeah, I, I mean, I have a whole boom bap album, like literally in the works right now. I got hundreds of hundreds of unreleased songs, you know. I want to hear that. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for <laughs> I'm, sure. I'm yeah. still old school. Um, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. You know, I, you know, uh, you know, like I, I, I try to stay on top of the new stuff. Um, yep. A lot of some of the some of the stuff. I don't love everything, but I, I do like it in bits and pieces. Yep. yep. Um, you now have like, I mean, how many streams do you have? Do you have a hundred million streams on your music? It looks like you almost do. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I think when you add up certain, like, I don't know if they're all monetized streams, but I do have 100 million when you add up the, the I mean, I'm just looking at your top five, you have yep. at least 40 million. <laughs> yeah, oh, on Spotify, the top five on Spotify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's been 100 million for a minute, but yeah, like, 50 million get... and 285,000 monthly listeners. Right, right, right. You did something friggin' right. <laughs> you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm super blessed i feel super blessed even one person's listening because i remember rapping at these these shows where i wish i could have sold more tickets you know so grateful for the opportunity you gave me but wishing i could have over delivered you know like yeah. i remember rapping in public and uh maybe maybe people kept walking maybe it wouldn't have been a, a moment worth watching again and i remember writing in my room listening to these guys looking up to them i remember hearing someone do something so cool with just their talent and their creativity and passion and like being like, I, I can do that. I want to do that. I dream to do that. So having a hundred million streams is like insane to me. And, you know, metrically or measurably, it'd, it'd be cool to hit a, hit a billion streams one day, but regardless, one person streaming me is even, even one person is like, it's, it's truly a dream because they have their own dreams too. You know, they have their own passions that maybe I'm unaware of. I can't actually support them, but they chose to support me and my dream. You know, I remember right. even taking it back to the Juice and Della days. Like, I remember the one thing I kept repeating in those dorm rooms is like, dude, I just, I just, we just got to work so hard. We can do it big enough that this is our livelihood. This is our living. All we have to do is wake up and worry about making music. So to have accomplished that at this age, and honestly, even few, for the past few years, maybe four, maybe three or four years or something, being self-sufficient, you know, with a, with a roof over my head and like the, the ability to do this off of spreading a positive message and music, I genuinely believe in and feel fire is the whole dream. I don't even think it needs to 10 X to feel accomplished where I'm at right now is the dream. And I don't want, I don't want this to slip away. You know, this is, this is the dream I was fighting for all along, you know, so hundred million, one million, one, it's all super special, you know? Yeah. Hold on one second. I, um, my, my speakers just went. Sometimes this like phone like throws me off. Um, oh, you, what are you doing? Voice memo? No, it just someone will call me and uh -huh. I want to be on airplane mode, but I wanted to like look at your stats and stuff. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yep, no, it's all good. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So so do you are you full time in music now? Do you make enough living to pay the bills yeah. and everything? Yeah, I mean that's wow. that's time back to the last thing is like that's that's all I prayed for and dreamed of when I was working all those hours, like sleepless nights in a dorm room. Like I don't even know where it's gonna go. But you know, that was that was literally my my dream if I were to quote what my dream was on a piece of paper and the fact that I've achieved it for the past couple of years is like that's the whole blessing. That's what I mean by one stream is like insane to me. You know, I hope to get billions, but being being able to have my living and my roof and my property and my my loved ones are taken care of and I, you know, support pets and a, and, a, and a girlfriend, you know, all these things like my brothers are good. It's like to be able to do that off something that was writing in a dorm room originally is like was my whole dream and it's my whole blessing, you know. And do you make majority of your money from streaming? So, so, so not from streaming. Um, there, I'm very grateful for the streaming income. It's definitely, definitely awesome. But uh, I don't know if you saw one of my songs, Smooth, has been a part of several like sync deals. And so, so I mean, obviously that implies there's more to more to music than just streaming. Just like shows, yeah. about more shows. You know, that'd be a whole nother area of my career. But like with the sync, I, I was on. 
the Budweiser commercials with Dwayne Wade, like Budweiser Zero, King of Beers, Budweiser Heavy, like for the past four or five years. And, uh, you know, th those commercials have been seen like during the Super Bowl and like playoffs, championships, like it's insane. And and then again, that boosts the streams too. So it's like all these all these times I might be like, dude, this song, this song isn't going to pop off. Like, I can't believe I even branched out this way. Like, how can I get it out there more? It's like when you're when you least expect it, you get an email you thought was spam and now you're playing during the Super Bowl, you know, it's like the never give up moment led to more than my, more than what my Spotify shows, you know what I mean? And you said never give up. I remember you posted a couple of times where it, like, it seemed like you had to take a serious break. Like stuff was getting yeah, yeah. you or something. Talk yep. about that. Cause what I didn't, I wasn't sure exactly what happened because yeah, you were yeah. like, I need to get away for a while. Yeah. I think it was, I think it was March, 2018 or was it 2018. I think it was 2018. Cause I, I had just been invited. So it's really crazy. Like I had just got on to tech nine and the strange music uh, teams radar, you know, now, now we're friendly and good friends and stuff. But at first it was like a little bit, it, it was kind of like, it was, it was such a positive shock, but it was crazy. One day I'm like sitting at a dinner table and my phone goes off saying Travis O'Gwen from strange music's calling. I'm like, how is that? Like never, I've never talked to him. I hope to talk to him one day, you know, but it was cause I had cold called him years before and like I cold called him to like pitch my music, never got a response back, nothing like that. But since it was so many years ago, I had already added it to my phone. And then he calls me and it's actually him saying, like, we love your music. We love what you're building. Um, we want to do a few month run with you on tour with Tech Nine. And so around that time, it was just like I was super I was super overwhelmed. And uh, and also like maybe a little bit of like anxiety or just worrying about the hypotheticals. You know, it wasn't wasn't quite a depression where I can't, you know, dig myself out of this rut. But it was just like so much was going on. And then also, I think, well, Worldstar also definitely family. I love Worldstar so much. They've helped me so much. But they were they were posting so many of my videos because every time I go out in public, it ended up being a bigger scene than we meant for it to be. And those were all going viral. So I was just like, um, like a lot was happening at once. You know, like a lot was happening at once. I was, the, the social media for sure was just like, there were more comments to read and I wasn't quite in like, these comments don't define what I'm doing or who I am type thing. So they were, they were I was reading them more you know, tour was coming up, which I was super grateful for. But of course, I was like, wow, better go on this huge tour. And, you know, just I just wanted to shut off my phone for a few days. But I also felt like if I just didn't use Instagram for a few days, it wouldn't it wouldn't really do the trick, you know, and I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I just I wanted to shut it off. I, I do see I didn't have to actually announce that to the world because it's OK to take a mental break. But like, that's literally what that was. That was the first time I'm like, how do you shut off your phone for like three to five days? And I learned from that because that was the first time I ever did it. You know what I mean? I didn't mean it to felt like to me, like people were getting to you. Yeah, like, for sure. Which is comments like a, were getting to you. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You were like, you knew like, F this. I need. You yeah, know, yeah, food yeah. Food. No, I remember. It's crazy because like I've, I've learned so much more from that moment that like a lot of these comments really mean nothing. I mean, if you're talking about impression, 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 follower, fan, diehard fan, hater, troll, if you think about all the categories, it's like. These comments that are getting to me really aren't the ones that matter. And those aren't the people that are going to stream my music or come to a show. So it, it was best to learn to ignore those or at least disregard or, or, or treat them in a different light. You know what I mean? Like now I've quoted some of these guys and used it to, to build viral streams, you know, but at first I was just like, this is crazy. Like, do they love me? Do they hate me? Are our haters going to be in the crowd at the show, which I've never been confronted by a hater in public. You know, it's, like they talk on the internet, but I've never actually met a hater in person. You know, I've, I've noticed yeah. people filming me or whatever, but like, there's never been an incident where someone says, dude, you're so fat. You have no neck. Like no one, no one says that shit in public. So I was definitely stressing it for no reason, but it was all new to me, you know? Right. I know, you know, I know you're on a tight schedule, but I want to talk about your hip accident. What the heck yeah. happened with your hip? Dude. So I don't actually know what incident sparked it off, but it was like literally destroyed. It was like, it was it was in full it was fully destroyed when i went to get the medical uh advice but i went in for x-rays at mass general to get to see why i'm in so much pain i was like kind of becoming immobile unable to walk without limping or looking like i'm tumbling and stuff and they told me what it sounds like it's been going on for a couple of years but they told me all the cartilage is gone which obviously your hip is a joint with the, which needs the cartilage and um it was bone on bone so it's like decaying and breaking off and chipping off and shit and dysplasia was was beginning to happen it was like like ah so much suffering from that huh. yeah it was crazy why you're so young for that why that's what they say i i don't actually know i don't i don't fully understand it because you know i remember it, it must have been something that was bound to happen because i remember when i was younger 
I would do this little like crack, you know, you crack your knuckles. I'd like crack my hip around that same area. And I, I wish I knew like, don't crack your hip, how they say like, don't crack your knuckles. But obviously 10, 15 years later, I'm here getting a hip replacement. <laughs> but one, one reason it was cool that I'm, I'm young enough for the, or like they, they say they won't, they won't operate if you're 30 or over, so, or they won't operate if you're, if you're under 30 um, hip replacements, but they let me come in under 30. And uh, they said, because I was so young, they were able to bump me up from mid this year to early January. So I'm like literally almost recovered. I'm like a week or two away from no cane. And I had the walker, I had the bed rest, I had the in-house PT, outpatient PT, you know? So it went by so fast. I have the whole year to grind and have fun. But if I was any older, I would have been last in line, obviously. Brutal. Well, I hope speedy recover. It looks like you're doing all right with that. It's been great. I'm getting stronger every day. Cool. So uh, we'll wrap up because I ain't got to go. But anything else you want to plug or talk about? Um, what, what are you working on next? I'm just working on another. You know me. I'm always working on something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what are you working plan? on some new music? No, for sure. For sure. What What are you? Uh, I mean, I don't, you can record this or not record this, but what are you so planning? To do? What are you what are you doing with the podcast? Like, what do you do? You have like a vision for it? Because this is awesome. But what yeah, is it? No, I mean, we just, you know, it's just another outlet. You know what I mean? Like, yep. I have fun with it. I'm not, you know, blowing up over this, but, you know, it's oh, good. It to... You saw with me, it can, some, something like that can also be a replayable moment, you know? You can clip oh, maybe, up. maybe you got to get some pointers from you, you know, make my podcast yeah. blow up. I mean, what they say about these streamers, like the uh, the the vlogging streamers, Twitch and Kick and stuff is like, it it's it's a new way to to showcase yourself, but the fans can actually end up spreading it for you to a point where it's like, you're going viral without any investment. Someone chopped up the funniest six seconds of the podcast or interview. And it's like that had a moment on TikTok. You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe just if you haven't already, maybe look up these, these, these videos you've done, these podcasts you've done, and then chop up the most inspirational seven second clip or the funniest joke that was told in this 11 seconds. And then if someone freestyles for you, chop that up and, you know, and then just post those because the thing is like, these TikTok and type real short apps, like they're giving you a chance at hitting that algorithm. When I when I check my video with 4.5 million views on TikTok throwing a basketball, it says like 92% came from for you page. So so they knew who to serve it to. And those weren't people that already followed me. You know, I don't know. Maybe maybe, right. maybe chop these up, the, the coolest moments and and gear it towards yeah. like inspiration or motivation or raps or jokes, you know? Yeah, you're the man, dude. Dude, you're the man. You're the man. I owe you so much. Man. I owe you for starting me out. You don't show. owe me anything, brother. You, <laughs> well, earned, you earned it, bro. You you, you, you outworked a lot of people, and dude, you're still you. outworking everybody. Even with a freaking bum hip, you're probably still outworking <laughs> That's everybody. Crazy. Yeah. No, honestly, dude. And yeah, this, this is awesome. Dude. I feel super comfortable, too. So, like, I mean, if you if there's ever another time you want me to come through for one of these, dude, I'll gladly come yeah. back. Definitely, bro. And um, and like I said, it's great to see your rise and success, man. You really, Thank you, man. You really earned that, bro. Thank you for being there from the beginning. That's that's yeah, insane. Man. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast. A very special rapper, hustler, marketer. Just, just news. <laughs> talk soon, bro. Man, thank you, bro. I'll talk to you Peace soon. Back.